Hello again and welcome to Thermodynamics Module Lecture Number 10. Uh, today we're continuing our discussion, which we started last time, on heat engines. Um, we start to introduce the idea of uh, entropy. Uh, we've not got, we're going to define it using the concept of reversibility, uh, which is a kind of a macroscopic approach to doing things. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about reversibility today. Uh, reversible process, uh, essentially uh, fictitious processes, uh, they don't happen in reality. Uh, but I've kind of, I put up a couple of statements on the whiteboard here, and let me just um, state what they are. So a reversible process is one that can take place in the forward and reverse direction by changing the conditions in the surroundings by only an infinitesimal amount. Uh, so what this statement is really telling us is that uh, it's not just about the system here. Uh, we, we know that when we approach our thermodynamic problems, we define our system. Uh, it's a, a collection of matter, uh, prescribed boundary, and we're interested in how it interacts with the surroundings, yes. Um, reversibility uh, is about both. It's not just, a, just about getting the system back to where it started, if you like, uh, reversing things. It's about getting the surroundings back as well. Uh, and that tends to be a bit of a tall order. Um, um, from the point of view of energy, you might argue, well, well, I can't see why that's not a big deal, you may say. Because in terms of energy, we've talked about energy as the uh, quantity. Yes, it's a, uh, it's a quantity uh, of energy uh, in the in the universe does not change uh, and if I have a system that loses energy uh, why can't I just uh, put the energy back into the system uh, that wouldn't be reversibility and the reason it isn't is because uh, it's not just about the system it's about the, the universe uh, it's about the surroundings as well now you might argue though from the point of view of energy uh, if I put the energy back into the system that I, that I took out, uh, then because the total energy of the universe hasn't changed, uh, that must be okay. Then I've got the right energies in the right place. But something has changed, and this is where this is the subtlety of this argument uh, is that something has changed in doing this. Uh, and in fact, to avoid all the the, the, uh, the shenanigans of trying to create systems that reverse things and get your get you, get you back to where you started, uh, we've got this statement, uh, which essentially cuts out all these possibilities. Uh, it's asking, it's saying, and if by an infinitesimal amount, you can all, you can reverse it by doing a a very small change. Um, so it's quite a clever little statement, this, uh, and we and it sort of dictates that we are looking at processes that are in some form of equilibrium, uh, because it's only when you've got equilibrium that if you've got uh, you know something ba in balancing, that a small change in one will will tip the balance in one favour over another. Um, so this is this is uh, this is the idea uh, with this particular statement. I've got another version, a reverse process can be reversed without leaving any net effect on the surroundings. That's a little bit vague, what do you mean by net effect? Uh, essentially, again, it's we're thinking about uh, both the system and the surroundings. Um, and it's sort of trying to hint to this idea of, uh, which I, the word I mentioned about the, um, the quality. Uh, something is changing, um, uh, something is changing when we have irreversible processes um, and reversible processes. Um, and uh, so this is uh, sort of the nuance of it. But I want to just have a look at some, uh, can we recognize reversible processes? This is what I want to, to is it, it's fairly easy to recognize them. Uh, so let's just consider some examples, I think. So let's have an example. Let's have an example, and let's think of a very simple thing. Then we've got a, a coffee cup with hot water, uh, hot coffee, sorry, uh, hot coffee. Uh, this is my cup. Um, there's my cup, Use my little handle. And in there, I've got some liquid, hot, hot liquid. 
this. Um, I define my system to be the coffee, shot coffee. Uh, then it's got a temperature T. Um, uh, and we've got a temperature for the surroundings, T naught uh, for the uh, everything outside the system, uh, which is the immediate surroundings as far as we're concerned. And the coffee's cooling. The coffee's cooling. Uh, and after a while, of course, what will happen is if this is the uh, if this is in a room or something, after a while, this temperature will reach the external temperature. The external temperature probably wouldn't change. You would notice it. It's like a reservoir, essentially. So energy is leaving this energy uh, in the form of heat is leaving uh, leaving the, uh, the hot coffee there. This is a reversible process. It's irreversible. Uh, you might argue, well, why is that? Because I can always heat the coffee back up uh, and put the energy back in there. But it wouldn't satisfy this, that's for sure. Um, right. a it's a versatile process, one that can take place in the forward and reverse direction by changing the conditions in the surroundings by only an infinitesimal amount. Um, and we're trying to essentially leave the surroundings unchanged. This is the thing. Uh, so energy is leaving this thing. So the energy is leaving uh, in the form of heat um, to the surroundings. Uh, the temperature's dropping uh, and it's cooling down. So this is a, an, well, we've mentioned the word spontaneous process. This is a spontaneous process. Uh, it's a natural process. We see it all the time. Um, a cooling process that's taken place. Um, but one thing for certain, I can't reverse it by an infinitesimal change in the surroundings. I cannot change the temperature by a uh, well, I, I, I can consider the change of temperature by an infinitesimal amount, but it won't, be, won't stop the cooling process, that is for certain. Uh, so this is definitely an irreversible process. Um, we can, as I said, bring the coffee back uh, to its, uh, you know, it cools down, we can eat it back up, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, we can't do it by means of... Uh, a, a tiny change in the surroundings. So we would identify that as uh, irreversible. Um, and in fact, it, it tells us, we can generally recognize the irreversible process fairly quickly. Uh, if you've got a finite temperature difference, it's irreversible. Uh, uh, if you've got a gradient and heat is just flowing uh, from one uh, to, uh, in response to that gradient, uh, then that would be, uh, an irreversible process. Could you make it reversible? Well, uh, it would have to be like this. Uh, so there's my coffee. There's my coffee cup again. So could it could it be reversible? It would have to be like this. That would be T, and this would have to be T. Well, uh, if I, well, if it was, if energy was flown out. In, in the, let's, say, let's say like that, we'd have to have a situation where the, where the situation was like that, where energy is flowing out, but we've only got a, a minute difference between the coffee temperature and the, uh, and the environment outside temperature. And of course, in that situation, uh, I can alter the temperature by a bit and, and reverse it. Yes, I can reverse the. Uh, I can reverse the. Uh, so I can make that um, uh, t plus two t plus, plus two dt. How about that? So I can a tiny, tiny change to the conditions outside uh, reverses the situation, and the and the, th the heat will flow in the opposite direction. Uh, so when we've got heat flow, uh, where the temperature is the same, essentially. There's not, there's, this is what this means, is that there's no difference between the temperature, really. You're just tweaking one in, the, in, the, in, the, in its favour. Then heat will flow, uh, and in that situation, that would be reversible. So that would be a reversible process. And why? Because you're not really changing anything here. Uh, it's essentially this. The situation is, is this situation, that you've got the same temperature, 
uh, in the in the surroundings as the as the temperature in your op copy, uh, then of course you can just tweak one, and the direction of heat will change. It reverses uh, without any net effect, of course, with no net effect on the surroundings, no change in the surroundings at all. Uh, an infinitesimal change is no change at all, uh, as far as that's concerned. So this is a, an example. Uh, of uh, uh, an irreversible process, a natural process, one not require a spontaneous process, one that doesn't require work as an intervention uh, that takes place uh, that we're all familiar with. And that would be an example of a uh, irreversible process uh, as opposed to a reversible one. So reversible ones, you know, invariably there for extraordinarily slow processes. You have to have equilibrium. And here we have thermal equilibrium between the coffee and its surroundings. Um, and uh, therefore it's balanced and a small, uh, a small adjustment of one uh, changes the direction of the transfer um, in that case. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that therefore is reversible. And it's clearly a very slow process, you know, usually uh, the, the manner in which cooling takes place, quite uh, how fast it takes place, um, de depends on the temperature gradient, of course. Um, the bigger the temperature gradient, the greater the rate of heat transfer. Um, and for these type of processes, when we talk about reversibility, we're not talking about time at all. Time is not a feature. These are uh, essentially quasi-static processes uh, even more reversible processes uh, are also quite static. They're a subset of, of these processes um, where you can, um, uh, everything's in equilibrium, everything's moving very slowly, uh, it's idealized. Uh, so that's, a, that's one example. Let's have a look at some of this. Um, so let's imagine, oh yes, we can imagine um, a mechanical example. Uh, of an airbag. Let's have a look at an airbag uh, where we've got um, uh, we've got some so we've got some uh, system which um, you know some airbag system. No, no, looks something like that. It's got some linkage. Uh, it lifts a the weight. There's a mass. Yeah, so we've had this before. Uh, and so this is a pro so what we yes so let's have a, put some links on these things. So essentially, as this moves that in that direction, uh, this moves uh, in this direction. Uh, this direction doesn't it? That goes like that. It's a pivoting about this. That's fixed pivot. Uh, it lifts the weight up. Let's let's do that. It lifts the weight up, and we've got some pressure in here. Uh, that's uh, by some means. Uh, so there's an example uh, of a reversible system. I think that's a reversible system. Uh, bear in mind, so this is happening very slow. This is happens very slowly. For this is a reversible system, it would have to be very slow. Um, and we can see, in fact, what we, how, to, how to reverse it. How to, how to, uh, so everything's balanced. The pressure is such that the, uh, the force is such that everything is balanced. Um, and if we're raising a weight, uh, it's in equilibrium. Uh, and to shift the balance in one favour or the other, we could uh, slightly lower the pressure in the, in the, in the system or slightly, uh, slightly decrease the mass, couldn't we? Or increase the mass, that's one, another way to do it. Um, so we have a, a, a with no friction. There has to be no friction involved in this. Uh, so the, the, all the pivot points are well oiled. No friction involved. Uh, this is clearly a reversible process. Um, uh, a static process, most certainly. It's in equilibrium. Uh, it's like force equal to a force. That's what's really happening. You, then you slightly increase the force by F plus DF, and it, it sends the system in one direction. Or you've got or uh, this this one's there and put F plus DF on this one, it sends it in the other direction. So that's that kind of situation where you've got equilibrium 
um, and where you've got infinitesimal changes, so you don't have any finite changes where you get acceleration and things like that, because then that would be irreversible. Uh, so that would be an example of uh, a reversible system. Uh, frictionless joints, you know, again, these things are artificial, you know, they don't occur in practice. They're, they're, they're kind of fictitious and they're very slow moving things as well. So we're talking about, you know, gradual rising of the weight. Um, uh, if you move quasi statically or reversibly now, we would say rather than quasi statically, uh, we're moving uh, reversible. Um, is uh, is a slightly tighter condition. So that's that's one. Uh, another irreversible one uh, we could imagine. Um, well, something that involves friction usually. So something that involves friction. So this is again. Uh, so we can imagine a, a, a an expanding balloon, uh, and we've got some we've got some uh, mass. Uh, on a table, um, and we've got uh, uh, we're pushing this along basically. So this is this is moving in this direction. Uh, pressure. Um, so our system could be could be the gas in the in the balloon, of course. Yes, there could be the glass in the balloon. So uh, and it's moving this thing along. Um, this would be an example of uh, an irreversible system. Uh, what's happening, of course, as you as you drive this thing along, uh, friction friction is happening. Uh, friction, well, it's a form of dissipation. Energy dissipates when you have friction it, uh, in form of heat. Um, so what will happen, of course, is it heats up the uh, well, the rod, the block, and the and it's and the thing it's sliding on. Uh, a slight elevation of temperature there. Uh, and we can't really think of a, a, a modification to this. Uh, any of a decimal change, that would reverse it, yes. Uh, if I stop this thing, if the, again, it's, it's like a force equal to a force. And uh, in principle, um, the direction going in either direction, but this is definitely going in one direction only. Uh, this is pushing it along. Uh, uh, the, the mass will not push it back. There's no, you know, it's reacting to the reacting, of course, to the, the force that's been applied. Um, and uh, a small change in the pressure, for instance, uh, lowering that pressure, would, the thing won't reverse. So, again, the, what's ruled it out is this idea of incessant change uh, would not. Uh, would not fix this uh, slightly change in the mass would not change anything at all it would not reverse this process uh, in a sense it's, it's quite easy to identify irreversible processes uh, well just about all processes are so I guess it is pretty easy temperature gradients uh, there's that's one friction that's another one if you've got any friction involved it's irreversible uh, you can't imagine a way to bring the surroundings and the system back uh, uh, to where it was by a tiny change, uh, by a tiny change. Uh, the tiny change is, is the, the thing that re restricts you, restricts you uh, in, in, this, in, this, in the definition of reversibility. So reversibility, and no, it's, okay, there's not a, it's not a great deal going on really. Essentially, they can be reversed, you know, uh, can be reversed, but in a way that doesn't affect things. Uh, you don't have to go to elaborate lengths to try to get things back to where they were. Uh, you have to think of a, a tiny changes to the conditions you've got uh, to get it to reverse. That's all it really is. So, in that sense, uh, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not such a big deal. Uh, what about heat engines? Because we're talking about heat engines, aren't we? So let's have another example. Uh, let's have an example of a heat engine. Um, so heat engines, remember what we said about heat engines. They've got, uh, these do have a, uh, interestingly, do have a temperature gradient uh, across them. Um, uh, but uh, it's not just heat transfer flown uh, directly. Uh, we've got some something else going on with heat engines. So let's have a look at our heat engines. So usually we've got this, haven't we? T1, 
we've got, because um, this is our direct engine, remember, uh, shaft work coming out. We've got the transfer uh, and and we've got uh, also, uh, so we imagine, um, we imagine some process where we have some machinery and we've had a look at this, we've had a look at this involving boilers, involving turbines, all this kind of thing, but we're not worried too much about what that uh, machinery is, but uh, we can certainly arrange it, that's the point. Uh, and these machines uh, regularly exist, we, they exist and we understand them. We've got a temp a reservoir, we imagine this as a temperature which is fixed, essentially. Well, okay, it's losing heat, but the temperature's not changing. It's such a big source of energy. Uh, or I can imagine as an infinite heat capacity. That's, uh, so that would stop the temperature. Of course, that is artificial, of course, but uh, so it's conceptual. Uh, and equally, we've got a cold reservoir. So temperature T2 is colder than T1, lower than T1. Uh, Energy flows, energy is rejected out of this thing, and we've got work being produced. Uh, could this be reversible? Uh, generally not, but we can make it reversible. Uh, and one way to think about making it reversible is to, um, well, what we'd need to have, and this example sort of sets it up, it says, well, look, if you've got a, a coolant, you've got a, uh, sorry, a, a fluid, then when, if you're in contact with this reservoir, then the only way you could have heat transfer um, that's reversible is if when the temperature is the same, essentially. So you're setting up in this set, set situation. So what I would need to do is have the fluid that's at the top of this thing, if you like, that passes uh, uh, of this part of the engine, uh, the temperature between the reservoir and the fluid would have to be the same. Uh, so that would have to be T1. And similarly, we've got heat transfer again here. Uh, this was, remember this in our design was our condenser, wasn't it? Uh, this was our boiler. Um, so this is the boiler phase where we, uh, where we're, we're at a combustion process. Uh, but essentially the, uh, the temperature of the, uh, uh, the the fluid, our steam, which was uh, that we were that, uh, for our steam uh, um, power station, uh, we had to have the same temperature. Uh, of course, that generally what that means is, of course, is that the uh, that the process is very small. Um, uh, for heat transfer to happen when the temperature is the same, the one slightly higher than the other. Um, the, the, of course, this is an idealised process, of course, that's what we're saying here. So this is um, the temperatures then between the, between the, the, the fluid and the reservoir is the same there, and similarly this one is the same as well, we'd have to have that to T2. Uh, what it, oh, an infinitesimal difference is we allow that. So we can have this one slightly bigger than this one to allow the energy to flow in the direction we want to flow. Um, well, that's as best as we can do. Uh, if we're thinking about reversible uh, the heat engine, um, what we mean by reversible, of course, is that we can run it backwards. Uh, with, uh, with basically everything reverses, um, and of course we can reverse the direction of this um, uh, this Q uh, by any possible change, uh, which is always possible. We usually call this idea externally reversible. So this this thing, uh, so for an heat engine to be reversible, it has to be both externally, externally, and internally reversible. So the heat engine has to be both external, externally and internally reversible. Uh, externally reversible is what I'm talking about here. This is the, that the, the temperatures between the reservoirs and the fluid uh, essentially have to be the same. That's that. But also in the, in the components that you've got, this fluid's going around and we saw boilers, we saw condensers uh, for our, 
our um, refrigeration unit, we saw throttle, throttle valves and all the rest of it. Um, so there has to be, essential, essentially, that has to be, uh, there has to be no gradients, really. This is what it points to. There's got to be, everything's got to be uh, done very slowly. Everything has to be in equilibrium. Uh, and uh, and obviously this is quite fictitious. It's just something that we uh, can imagine and we can create. So we can have reversible. We can have reversible heat engines. Uh, this is our engine. Uh, we can have reversible heat engines. Um, but we have to arrange for it such that uh, uh, such that um, that things uh, temperatures no temperature gradients in the thing. Uh, there's no pressure gradients. There's, everything is the everything is um, um, uh, equal, uh, equilibrium, and then a small change could drive it back in the opposite direction. This is the so we can actually imagine this being turned round, and that would be set it up as uh, T one again. Uh, and what we can imagine is that the other thing is reversed. That we can do it like that. We can actually get it to go like that. Uh, some people actually re put these engines at E that way on uh, T two when you've got them reversed. Uh, reversed heat engine, uh, and we can only possibly do this. We can only possibly do this if the the temperatures are the same. You can see that you know it's. Um, that this temperature is slightly higher than that one, then it switches around, yes, uh, and you move it in the opposite direction. Uh, so this would be an heat engine, which is, so we do have this idea of reversible heat engines, um, that's for sure. Um, and we can, in principle, reverse them, uh, but uh, things are very, very slow. The other thing I should probably mention, you probably might have noticed, I'm generally talking about quantities of energy here. When it comes to practical systems, you're generally not talking about quantities, you're talking about rate. Uh, we're not talking about rate here because we're, uh, we're trying to, we, we, so this is, these are, these generally, these W's and Q's are in, in kilojoules. Um, uh, but on, on, on practical engines, you're generally talking about the rates of heat transfer. Uh, but because we're, we're interested in reversible heat engines, uh, and the idea of reversibility, uh, we imagine things as very, very slow, and in a sense, rate is then uh, not, not an issue. We, we, in quasi-static processes, um, which we uh, looked at right at the beginning of the course when we looked at our systems, uh, time is not a feature. Time is not a feature. Uh, quasi-static means that uh, you move between equilibrium points um, practically, it means very slow, but uh, it's, it's just conceptually, it, it says time is not involved. Uh, so this is the reason why we're generally thinking about quantities of energy. So I imagine a Q1 could be a kilojoule, you know, uh, up there. Uh, so one kilojoule in, maybe not 0.5 kilojoules out. In terms of work, not 0.5 kilojoules goes to in waste energy. Uh, waste heat, as we call it, or rejected heat, Q2. So that's the way I imagine this. So you just say there's a quantity of heat in, quantity of heat out, quantity of heat rejected. Um, uh, and when we reverse this, of course, I'm just everything reverses. I've got half coming in from the from the work. So in this case, half coming in from the um, from the uh, from the cold cold uh, temperature. And one then goes back out from the um, uh, to the um, to the hot reservoir there. So we we're talking about kilojoules rather than uh, kilowatts here. Uh, uh, so this is the the way we look at these things. Again, it's just so it captures this aspect of reversibility. Because as soon as you talk about rate, then you you generally talk about uh, irreversible things. You just can't you can't even bring the concept of reversibility into into consideration. You have to be talking about quantities of things. Uh, uh, you can't generally run things at rate. 
versibly. You just uh, you're gonna well, you can't kind of imagine it conceptually, uh, but practically you can't do it. So okay, so what I want to do now is so that's my uh, reversible and irreversible. Uh, uh, they're quite they're quite interesting concepts. Uh, the whole idea is that something's changing when you when you when you do an irreversible process. Something's happened. The energies are not changed. The quantities of energy, but something else is changing. Uh, this is it's trying to sneak up on what what it is that else is going on, uh, and we we get it there. It's uh, it's a little bit of a journey, uh, but at the moment, reversible is it's very easy to spot. Reversible, irreversible means you've got a gradient, temperature gradient, heat flows. Uh, that's uh, you've got, you see a temperature gradient anywhere uh, there between the reservoir. It's uh, if you see our gradient, then then forget it. And of course, heat in practice generally only flows when you've got a gradient. <laughs> so uh, you've, only when you've got uh, infinitesimal changes can you really, uh, as far as heat transfer is concerned, uh, talk about uh, reversibility, reversible process there. Um, uh, in that case, and also friction. See any friction involved? That's it. It's irreversible. Uh, you can't change. You can't do a. a, a you can't imagine uh, a small change that you can make in the surroundings to get the thing to reverse. Or uh, it's very easy to spot them at least that uh, when you've got irreversible uh, processes. Uh, okay, so let's let's get on to looking at the heat engines a bit more. And looking at the efficiency of these engines and defining what we mean by efficiency uh, of uh, each engine. So we want to do that. Um, and well, we can in fact introduce, before we do that, we could actually look at the second law of thermodynamics. We could actually introduce the statement now, uh, which uh, uh, Yes, we can, we can, we, we can do that. Uh, let's introduce, so the second law of thermodynamics, let's introduce these statements. So the second law of thermodynamics, and these are, these are uh, there's all, there's different forms of the second law. Um, and these are the sort of uh, the experimental observer, observed forms I'm going to talk about. Uh, and the first one is by Kelvin Planck. Uh, so Kelvin uh, statement. Uh, the Kelvin Planck statement. Um, yeah, that's okay. So, which, uh, which, well, let me let me look at the, let me write the engine. It's it's to do with heat engines. These come with heat engines, uh, and basically, Kevin Planck rules out this. He says that you can't have this situation with a heat engine. You can't have uh, this situation. So that's my engine going around some cycle. Um, Basically, Kevin Planck statement really says, uh, uh, well, it's, it's well, it's it's it is impossible to uh, to to build to have a device, uh, well, for to possible, uh, well, for a device. To operate in a cycle and uh, produce um, and produce a net amount and produce a net amount of work. So this is the Kelvin Planck version. So operating the cycle is the important point here. Uh, it's impossible to have a device, uh, for a device to operate in a cycle, so our engines, if you like, our heat engine, uh, of course, it's such a device, uh, captures 
the essence of all these devices after all. Um, uh, uh, well, I should have said, <laughs> uh, 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 well, uh, from, from a single reservoir corp, just net back to a, uh, from a single, well, okay. <laughs> it's right then. Uh, well, let's uh, receiving, let's put it like this, receiving heat from a single reservoir and producing a net amount of work. Okay, let's be, let's tie it up a little bit more. So essentially, it's this situation really, it's saying that you can't have this situation that energy is uh, Q out Q1 is energy flown into the engine, and you can't and you're not rejecting any energy. Uh, essentially, it's impossible. Even though this this obeys conservation of energy, Q1 is equal to QF, WS. So energy in equals energy out. Um, this is no energy accumulation in the in the in the in the engine itself. Um, because it's going around a cycle, of course. So it's, it's going around a cycle. You can't have any net accumulation there. Um, uh, so since it's operating a cycle, uh, Q1 here must equal this situation would have Q1 equal to WS, wasn't it? The energy in equals so if a kilojoule comes in, a kilojoule comes out. There's no accumulation in in, in the in the cyclic process that you can't you can't have that. Uh, so it's impossible to have a, uh, for a device to operate in a cycle. So you need for a single reservoir T1. And producing a net amount of work. So that's the Kelvin Planck statement. It is an, it's an observational statement. It's um, experimentally observed, observed. It's simply the case that all the things that we make, um, all the engines that we make, are rejecting the heat at some point. Uh, generally, and we saw it, didn't we, when we were looking at the um, our steam turbine? We had a, we had a condenser there. Uh, to get the thing to go around a cycle, we had to cool. Um, and that's so. This 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 statement about operating in a cycle is quite a strong statement. It's a powerful statement, powerful restriction. Um, that um, um, that um, this that this law constrains the, this the thing, if you like. Um, so we can't have this. This is what it says. This is no, basically. <laughs> this this type of situation is something we can never have. Um, <coughs> so uh, the, there's another one we call a Clausius Clausius statement uh, of the second law, and in a picture 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 form of it is um, it's this one. It's uh, again, we've got a, a, an engine, uh, but this is the with, between two reservoirs in this case, T1 and T2, and it's basically ruling this out. Uh, Q1, Q2, um, and this is well, typically, this would be our reverse one, wouldn't it? We imagine this is a, a reversed engine. Uh, but we found with our refrigeration, we need work. Uh, so it's impossible. Uh, so this is T2, of course, is T2 is, you know, T2 is colder than T1. So uh, spontaneously, we know that when we, well, in our engines, uh, T1 is the hot and T2 is the cold. Uh, and we are, in fact, using the uh, spontaneous process to produce work there because a hot temperature and a cold temperature then uh, heat will invariably flow from hot to cold um, so you don't generally get it flowing from cold to hot uh, so that is generally not what again uh, conservation of energy would suggest here that q1 is equal to q2 yes uh, again this is going on a cycle um, that way in this case uh, uh, but we can't arrange that practice uh, without uh, without work, uh, essentially. Um, 
So it's impossible. That's no, the same type of thing. It is impossible uh, for a device to operate in a cycle uh, and produce uh, what is it, each transfer from a cold reservoir, let's do it like that, like that to a hot or a cold body to a hot body. So that's essentially paraphrasing this. Again, it's possible for a device to operate in a cycle. This bit is the important bit uh, and produce essentially uh, what we've seen in our picture there. If we can't do this. This is not possible. First law is being uh, satisfied, certainly. Uh, but we find um, if we ever build any machines, we have to put work into this thing. It's only by work that we can get it to... Uh, we found, in fact, that um, when we looked at our refrigeration unit, workers put an energy in, yes. We not, we, we certainly wouldn't be possible to get this to go around a cycle. It, it was needed. Uh, we needed to drive the substance around, but it also it was supplying energy. Uh, so work is most definitely needed. Uh, so these are these are two statements of the um, of the uh, of the second law based on uh, experimental observations. So the second law really is telling us, uh, in a sense, uh, what type of things you're allowed to do. Yes, uh, even though you have got conservation of energy. So there's conservation of energy as far as this process is concerned. Um, uh, that's so certainly the first law has not been contravened there. Uh, we're satisfying the first law, the energy going in, the energy going out, what's happening in the engine, it's uh, the, the net energy um, is, is the same. Of course, the, the substance is just going around a cycle after all. So uh, anything that goes around a cycle, uh, you know, but whatever it started with, you come back and it's still still got the same, still properties. Uh, but here also, we, we're not contravening uh, the first law that has been satisfied. But what uh, we are contravening now is these statements of the second law. So that is uh, that. Is that. So they're the two statements. Uh, there's other forms of this, and uh, when we get into define entropy, entropy it's slightly more, uh, um, you know, it's, it's okay, it's, it's great, you know, but these apply to particular things, yes. Uh, the, the wide ranging, um, uh, they are wide ranging. Um, and they do bring around the entropy, but uh, once you've got entropy, there's a slightly different version of the second law, which basically says that uh, the uh, essentially the universe um, viewed as sort of isolated uh, uh, with natural processes going on, the entropy will always increase. And this is the this is slightly slightly preferred version by me certainly than the uh, than these particular statements. Um, uh, uh, but um, yeah, we can see the, and in fact, when you look at when you go to that statement, you can come and you can show these statements for fly as well. So, uh, the slightly more powerful versions of the of the of the second law. But these are these are the first statements. These are experimental observed. These are based on observation. Uh, no machine has ever been built that's been able to do this and operate on a cycle or do that. So, uh, so this is our heat engine approach, uh, and this is our, uh, of course, this is our sort of refrigeration or heat pump thing. Um, well, this would be great if we could do this, of course, then we could, uh, we wouldn't have to do any work and we could heat our homes up, yes, so we can cool our, our, <laughs> cool our food stuff and uh, we wouldn't have to pay any uh, electricity for that. Uh, but clearly, uh, uh, we've not we've not managed to come up with fridges and heat pumps uh, that be, uh, that be operate in that sense. Uh, 
Uh, and this would be great, yes, for electricity. We would be able to produce our power stations. Um, and uh, yeah, with uh, yeah, with um, without any rejection of heat whatsoever. Uh, they're very efficient, yes. Well, we're going to talk about thermal efficiency now. So let's have a look at thermal efficiency. Um, let's have a look at thermal efficiency uh, of our heat engines. Uh, and what do we mean by thermal efficiency? So what do we have? We have various heat engines. So we've got, so what we are allowed to have, uh, this is what we are allowed to have. Um, Q1, we can have the temperature of our reservoirs uh, and we can be operating on a, uh, an engine. We're allowed to have this situation and let's have a look at the, uh, the, the reversed engine, T1. Uh, we have this situation, uh, T2, um, and we've gone Q2 in that direction and we've gone Q1. Now, we've, you might have noticed that uh, our convention of uh, positive work and negative work and positive Q, negative Q, uh, uh, we sort of abandoned it slightly here. Uh, basically, the, these are positive. I'm sure in the positive directions. We don't worry too much about it for this. Uh, but there we go. There's our reversed uh, engine. Uh, so what do, we, what do we mean by efficiency? Uh, well, the question, the question is, uh, with efficiency, is what you want over what you supply, yes? Uh, so efficiency, um, efficiency could be viewed as uh, what you want over what you are willing to give, or what you supply, yes, that's something that will do. Essentially, uh, so it's a ratio, you know. So what do we want for an engine? Um, so we're allowing this. We can't do this, this is for sure. Uh, but what we want, of course, is work. Yes, this is what we want. And uh, what we're supplying is heat uh, from this reservoir. So I think for, for our engine, uh, I'm going to use this eta symbol, thermal efficiency, let's what we call it. Uh, for what you want, of uh, uh, what you supply. So what we what we want, I want work. Where I'm supplying is Q1. Uh, so that's my thermal efficiency uh, of an engine. Uh, well, I'll just mention that in a second, but uh, we've also got uh, that uh, WS. Well, we've got the first law here. First law says that, and bear in mind that the engine's going around a cycle, the energy doesn't change there. So what comes in here must come out here, that's the. So we can see that for this thing, Q1 is equal to WS plus Q2, that must be, that's our first law applies to the engine, so that applies there. Uh, so I can get rid of the W here, I think. So WS is equal to Q1 um, minus Q2 over Q1, yeah, so, and that thing, I can divide that by top and bottom there, 1 minus Q2 over Q1. So that's my thermal efficiency, we call that. Thermal efficiency uh, is given by that particular, that particular, uh, Ratio there, so 1 minus Q2 over Q1. And what we've ruled out, in fact, is Q2 equal to zero. Yes, this thing, uh, Kelvin Planck statement says that you can't have 100% efficiency. If Q2 is zero, we would have one, and that would be, uh, well, WS is equal to Q1, of course, that's, the, uh, that's what we get, uh, which is, um, uh, which we essentially can never reach. We can never do that, it's not possible. Uh, we can't have Q2 equal to zero. The second law of thermodynamics is ruling that out. Uh, we cannot have 100% efficiency with these things. There's always going to be some rejection of heat. Uh, it turns out it's uh, quite a lot of rejection of heat, actually. Uh, uh, is that, you know, 40% of the energy could easily be 
or more could easily be uh, rejected from these things. Uh, we, even with the modern power stations, uh, we're going to see, in fact, uh, what the maximum efficiencies are. Um, and it turns out it's dependent uh, on the temperatures of the reservoirs rather than the machinery. It doesn't matter how, how clever you get with machinery. Uh, there's some barrier to get in very high efficiencies. Uh, but certainly at the moment, we're ruling out 100% efficiently. That, that, is, that is not allowable. Uh, what about the uh, what about the uh, refrigeration unit and the heat pump? Uh, so we're talking about so we talk about thermal efficiencies. We talk about coefficient of performances when it comes to coefficient of performance uh, when it comes to uh, refrigeration and heat pumps. Uh, so I'll explain that in a minute. But coefficient of performance. Call that beta, uh, and for a refrigeration unit, what do we want? Uh, well, what do we want? Uh, refrigeration unit um, is we want Q2, I think. We want to take energy from the coal store. Yes, that's what we want. We, the Q2 is what we want. Uh, Q2, and what do we uh, supply? We we do work. We supply work. Yes. So what we want or what you supply. So coefficient of performance, uh, as far as the um, as far as the uh, um, refrigerator is con concerned, beta uh, is Q two over uh, W S. Now these things are greater than one. <laughs> uh, so it's a, uh, so the higher the, the higher the coefficient of performance, the better uh, in that case. Uh, but what you can't have. Um, uh, you can't, okay, we have to Q2, uh, we can't have WS equal to zero. I mean, that would be, oh, that would be really good. Uh, so big numbers of beta are good, um, and uh, WS being the smallest possible. Yeah, great. I mean, if you make the work, if you do not have to do any work here, then uh, clearly this is a very <laughs> efficient system. Uh, there's not, no possibility of that. Uh, uh, yeah, if you get up to beaters of uh well you know you get up to 20 or something like that you might that stuff would be great you know uh so generally you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get infinite numbers uh also the same thing as far as the uh as far as the um as far as the the heat pump's concerned the heat pump actually want q1 so we call this beta dash for the heat pump beta dash is the coefficient of performance um, and it's rather than Q2, we want Q1. But well, again, we have to supply work. Um, uh, and as you can see here, that uh, Q1 for this thing, for energy concerned, is equal to WS plus WQ2. Sorry. So that that's uh, energy applied. So this is going in, that's going in, it comes out here. Nothing changes it because it's going out the cycle. Uh, so I can actually, uh, for this thing, I can stick that in there, can I? Uh, WS, uh, so this becomes WS plus Q2 over WS, which is equal to 1 plus Q2 over WS. And if you've got this beta, you'll notice then beta dash is always one bigger than beta. Uh, so that's just a little, uh, so caution of performance of the heat pump. Um, so the heat pump and the and the refrigerator, you know, essentially the same type of device. Um, we are running out of time. The same type of device, so and the only difference you get then is that uh, the you, it's always, there's a relationship between the coefficient of performance of the heat pump and that for the, uh, and that for the, uh, and that's the coefficient point of the refrigerator, and it turns out the relationship is that the heat pump is one plus add on one uh, for that, that device, depending on what you want, essentially. But essentially, the same thing, uh, just that you're focusing on different things uh, in, their, in, in, in their design. Well, I, th I think that's as much as I want to say. We've introduced this second law.
uh, of, of thermodynamics. Uh, second law, quite interesting. It's starting to rule things out. This is what it's this is what it's about. It rules certain processes out, which are allowed by the first law. Um, uh, we want to get to the, uh, the entropy. We're not there yet. We, we are on the journey. Uh, we've introduced the concept of reversibility. It's a very simple spot. Uh, irreversible processes that generally got a temperature gradient uh, with heat transfer and uh, friction. These are the ones that have got uh, their irreversible. Very easy to spot them. Uh, easy to spot because they are a fictitious device. Uh, you generally don't get in any process. So, uh, there we go. And usually we think they're very slow processes to get reversible. Uh, where we can reverse things by slight small changes in the in the environment. Uh, our heat engines. Uh, next time I'm going to consider continue this a bit further, and we're going to look at um, uh, reversible heat engines. Uh, we've introduced them, uh, but we're going to um, uh, come up with slightly sure that for reversible heat engines, these these coefficients that we've induced here only depend on the temperatures um, and this then uh, it provides a means of uh, introducing the temperature gain the thermodynamic temperature scale uh, because if it if a reversible process only depends on the temperatures it didn't depend on the sub substance that you're using it could be you know it could be water it could be anything uh, any liquid you would like to think of or uh, any thermal fluid uh, and therefore it, you can see it's a conceptual way of defining the temperature scale um, uh, rather than the thermometric way, which is the common way of doing it, of course, uh, with you know, expansion of mercury in a tube, this type of thing. Uh, uh, so I'll say goodbye then. Bye bye.